Now, basic Christianity gives of the Holy Spirit 101. One of the things that is always important for us to know is the difference between theoretical and practical. A lot of things we are taught in Christianity, they're theoretical, and we need the practical side. Like even when we were uh, enjoying the song that was composed uh, during the communion time and the offertory time, uh, what is the song again? Uh, the power God in your soul. And they're singing about the book of Acts and the wind of God came down, the power that is there, power God is in your soul. And then you turn around and say, is this just a song or is it something you could right now exercise? Or when we sing, uh, there's a river of life flowing out from us, makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. And then you say, okay, right now, do I have the power? So, practical or just theoretical? We don't want Christianity to be just theoretical, all right? We don't want to be able to sing songs of healing and have no healing. You don't want to be singing songs of breakthroughs and have no breakthroughs. Although sometimes there's a gap between what you believe and what is manifest. And there goes the explanation. The word manifest. Manifest is the key. We know that Jesus Christ waited 30 years before He manifests miracles. He was Son of God. He was redeemed. He was sinless. He could hear God. He had a knowledge of God. But there was a time and a place to do the works of God. And a time and a place came after he overcame the devil in his own life. There were no signs and wonders until after the 40 days and 40 nights. Correct. There was not a single healing miracle until the 40 days and 40 nights. And what was the 40 days and 40 nights representation? It represents he practiced it and it worked in his personal life first. So like the challenge that they have of Jesus, you know, heal thyself before thou heal others. Does it work in your life first before it work in other lives? So in terms of Christianity 101 on the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the exercise of the gifts all operate on one word. And uh, it's, oops, let me turn it to this way so you can see the Bible differently. And let's do a little principle. I like to outline the principles as simply as possible because it's like gifts 101. The first key word is the word phaneros or the word translated manifest manifest. When it manifests, it is physically real. Until it manifests, it, is, could, it should be theoretically correct. Because good theology is in line with truth, and truth is the true reality. And with truth, you could do other things. So good theology is also required. Good doctrine is required uh, in that. But what we see under the word manifest, and let me point to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And one of the things you will notice about uh, this church and this ministry is that we're very practical people. Uh, I don't like theoretical stuff that doesn't work. If theoretical stuff doesn't work, then something is not linked somewhere. Something is still missing. And if theoretical stuff does not explain what is true reality, what is actually happening in the spirit, and what is actually heaven-like, then 
it is no good. It is only a conjecture, a theory. We need something to explain true reality, which is why I said that uh, there are very few pe places people can go to when they want to seek the truth, especially if they are dying of uh, sickness and disease and they got three more months to live. Uh, and uh, both ways we can help the person. Let's say that if the person really is such a stage that, you know, and God did not see uh, a manifestation such that the person could be healed, or it's time for the person to go home and, and, and be with God. Or the person needs a miracle and needs a context somewhere where truly they can pray and have God hear them. Even if God says no, they want to still hear God. And God says yes, there's a possibility that they receive a miracle. There are very few places for people to go. Because most of the time, uh, traditional Christianity has only been for people who want to live a nominal uh, life, like, like part of the world, except we, we have a different philosophy. But for people in desperation, there are very few places to go. Uh, even if the person is about to die and go to heaven, wouldn't you want to find out as much as you can about where you're going? What heaven is like? And uh, in both counts, we can help these people because we have been heaven to before. We can describe places in heaven, describe what it's like, describe what is the first thing you encounter when you come out of your body. <laughs> these are very practical things that we can describe and prepare a person for heaven if there's really time for them to go home. On the other hand, we can also help because there's no place that can pray like I believe we pray. All night prayer, waiting on God, fasting, 40 days, 21 days, really seeking God and praying through. One day, traditional Christianity and normal Christianity will not be enough with the increasing greatness of darkness that is coming upon the earth. And everything that will be shaken will be shaken. It was even prophesied way back in Enoch's time. Why Enoch is an important thing, we we'll touch on this Friday. Because Enoch was the seventh from Adam, and he was uh, four generations from the flood, uh, because uh, Noah was his great-grandson. And at that time, uh, only a few humans have died. Most of them lived 900 odd years. And um, the spiritual world was being arranged. Things were being arranged, and the fallen angels were roaming about, and there was uh, open vision everywhere, and the fall of Satan in the time of uh, Genesis 6, that started to happen, and fallen angels actually came down, he lived at a time when fallen angels came down intermarry with the human race, producing several generations, and he saw God preparing prisons for them and all those uh, things. So it is a very significant, important book that is missing. It is the one book that tells you the origin of evil spirits that the Bible seems to pass over. That's why it seems to be missing. Some part of knowledge is missing. Because there it talks about how evil spirits came about through the half-breeds that were there. When they died and they became disembodied, they got no more they are not humans, neither angels. So they became evil spirits. And the word is mentioned in the book of Enoch. We'll look at those things of great interest. But uh, uh, between now and Friday, and those of you online, those of you who are there, uh, and uh, usually Friday sessions, we might allow uh, all night people to participate uh, in Q&A when we have that. And uh, read the book of Enoch. Uh, and uh, it should be available. I know Colin has a PDF copy, a good copy. So read that, and, uh, and then you can, we will allow Q&A on the Book of Enoch when we touch on Friday. So that's going to be something interesting. Uh, we will allow that for those online too. So sometimes I include those online, sometimes I exclude uh, on Q&A on the Book of Enoch. So here we have in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, we're talking about uh, gifts of the Spirit 101. And it says that there are diversities of gifts in verse 4. 
but the same spirit, there are differences of ministries, but the same law, there are diversities of activities. It is the same God who works all in all, but the manifestation. Here's the word, manifestation, from the word faniro. And uh, you can see the word faniro here, P-H-A-N-E-R-O, phanerosis. So phanero or phanerosis uh, is a word to manifest. To manifest means from a spiritual reality, it becomes a physical reality. So the difference between what I call theoretical and practical is bridge. There is, as I say, a time period between both. Now, when we look at the word manifestation, Faniros, we have point A here, the main key to the gifts of the Spirit is the word manifest. Now, this is a practical session. I will afterward look at what manifestations can come to you all and how manifestations come. But before we talk about manifestation, uh, in detail, there are sub-points on the manifest. We need to know that before something can manifest, there is what I call a uh, necessity for it to come true at one pinpoint, I would call it, or one molecular level, through some place, somewhere. And uh, it needs to be manifest. Uh, at a certain point. So there are certain laws involving it. And uh, I'm going to put it this way. Uh, mathematics is easier. It has to come at one point. And then from that one point, it manifests to whatever points there are, whatever uh, dimension. There has to be a crossover. Like, none of us would know that light consists of seven colors until someone breaks the light up into seven colors, which I believe Isaac Newton did that. And when you put a crystal or prism and make the light go through, the light is scattered and suddenly you say, hey, why are there seven colors? So are the seven colors related to the light? And yes, it is. But when you look at white light, it doesn't seem to have all the seven colors. And we, we wonder, how can red, blue, purple, green, orange, all that mesh together and become white? Because if you actually do that on your color plate, it doesn't, it becomes black. But yet all the different colors merged together became white. And that's what we read as white. And when you read something as red, it's because red is being reflected. When you see something as blue, it's because blue is being reflected. But we accept it as a fact. Because somebody proved it scientifically. And just as you can have the rainbow, uh, that comes out from white light, you can reverse the process and have the rainbow go back into uh, white light again. So you know that both are actually the same substance. Uh, the way we mix color mixture is different. Our color plates, when you mix all the different colors, it becomes more brownish and black because it is reflecting uh, all the different things and then suddenly it absorbs all the color and becomes black. And uh, that is 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 a chemical thing. It's not really the wavelength of light. And um, so there has it comes for a point. The way we put it, it has to come to one life. It has to be personalized. First, when you personalize it, it means it cross barriers. There are barriers preventing it from being real in the physical realm. For example, TV 
waves. There are TV waves today being broadcast. So you just put your antenna out, and the TV captures, the area captures the TV waves and TV broadcasts, and then it converts it into electrical signal. Electrical signal converts it into colors that it can, it can uh, uh, display on your TV, and then you see a picture. But it's invisible. If if you were unaware, if you live about uh, 500 years ago, you wouldn't know those waves exist. Radio waves, right now, you know, the radio waves are going through your body. Uh, you got FM 93, FM 92, all these, there are a lot of conversation going on in this uh, invisible realm. You're totally unaware because your ears and your body system are not adapted to detect radio waves. So you need an electronic signal which can capture the radio waves, convert it into sound waves. Then we can hear the sound waves. But all the time, the waves are flowing on. The same with Wi-Fi. Right now, there's a lot of 101010 being broadcast all over as computer data. The wireless, wireless data is being broadcast all the time through the internet, uh, especially the Wi-Fi. And this data is flowing to you, but you're unaware of its ex existence. Until you have something that overcomes the barrier and brings it to the dimension where it manifests. Can you see that? where you manifest in a certain dimension that you can read, you can hear. Jesus did that. Let me point to the life of Jesus. In Luke, Gospel of Luke, chapter 4. No miracles took place, since we are interested in the gifts operating in his life. No miracles took place until after of wilderness. In verse 1, Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Up to that time he was 30 years old. God was still pleased with him. You don't have, you don't have to do signs and wonders to please God. All you have to do to please God is to love God and walk in His perfect will. And you please God not through doing ministry work. Ministry work is just a calling. It's just a job that God said, okay, I want you to do this job. You please God by living your life in love with God and meditating on His Word and loving Him. So Jesus did that. And remember the voice that said, you are my beloved son. You are my son in whom I am well pleased. God is well pleased with Him. After the water baptism, at 30 years, he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, he, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. We did not know what's going on for 40 days. We only know what happened after the 40 days in the last three temptations that were recorded. Everything that happened in 40 days, not recorded. But we can assume that during 40 days, Jesus was tested and the test was very real. In the 40 days, Jesus encountered the spiritual realm. Jesus was tempted in the physical realm. But he encountered the spiritual realm. So the 40 days, he traversed between the spiritual and the natural. Both were operating at the same time. He was feeling both his effect. And something supernatural happened. In the physical realm, his body went to a state of... Uh, for lack of a better word, trans-dimensional substantiation. Where for 40 days and 40 nights, it survived without food and water, which is not really possible in the physical. His body went trans-dimensional and trans-natural. It surpassed the natural ability. So something happened when he operated in a spiritual law, he was tested to the fullness.
We do not know what happened in 40 days. We only know the result. At the end of the 40 days, he was tempted the last three temptations. And those three temptations were recorded like a summarized version of what happened. We saw that it tempted him in the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And he was taken to the temple to throw himself down. He was told to turn stones into bread, which he refused to do for his own personal needs. And he was tempted with seeing all the glories of the kingdom of the world and take a shortcut if he bow and worship Satan. And he refused. So only three temptations were recorded, but 40 days expired. We only know a summarized version. In those days, he ate nothing, and afterward, when they ended, he was hungry. So he was actually hungry. When the time ended, Jesus, did he felt hungry during the 40 days and 40 nights? Did he, did he not? Yes? No? Yes? Did he feel hungry? Yes? What did the Bible say? Did he feel hungry or not feel hungry? Now, it says here, In those days he ate nothing, and afterwards, when he ended, he was hungry. Which imply he was not hungry until he ended. So his body went into a uh, like temporarily holding of the physical appetites until the 40 days was over. It entered into the state of uh, trans-dimensional substantiation. Now, is that possible? We know that Elijah was taken and he has never died until now. We know that Enoch walked with God and he has never died until now. But they both will die in the book of Revelations, chapter 11, during the eight, seven years in the middle of the tribulation. We got seven times seven plus one, which is the last week of Daniel. So they are in a plus one, which is the Jewish period in the middle of the tribulation. After they have prophesied for 1,260 days, divided by 360 is exactly three and a half. So somewhere in the middle of the tribulation, they were allowed to be killed. So where is the body, the physical body of Elijah and Enoch right now? In a state of transubstantiation. It is not in a, in a cold storage and their soul and spirit are moving around. Some of you have seen visions of Enoch. I met with Enoch and Elijah. And they look like spirit beings. But they are different from every other spirit being because Moses has died. Abraham has died, David has died, and they have received new resurrected bodies, the first resurrection. But, you know, Elijah hasn't died yet. So their body is now in a state, for lack of a better word, trans-dimensional substantiation. Oh, big long word to explain a very simple thing. That means... It's in a dimension where the physical law don't bind them and affect them. God can do that. That is why if God can do that, and Moses was, Jesus was not the only one who went for 40 days and 40 nights without food. Moses also went through that. Three 40 days. And it is possible that somewhere in the presence of God, time stopped for your body. Time stopped for your body. And the physical dimension does not affect you anymore. This is doctrine, theory, and truth. Because it's teaching from the Word of God. See, we need the truth to come forth. And uh, which, let me 
Point to this. In the meantime, between this uh, AB and the manifestation, these areas must get into truth, facts, or spiritual reality, or true reality. If you enter into the wrong reality, Satan might use it to produce a wrong image and deception. So there has to be truth being believed, truth being taught, truth being understood before a manifestation. These are things and that are necessary, can be accelerated. So it says, in those days he ate nothing. Only when it ended, he did not feel hungry. Press the pause button. button. From time to time, some of you experience that. When there was a surge of energy, even though you're tired, and you don't feel tired, and then there is a surge of anointing or energy and your body did not feel the symptoms that you normally feel or hunger. Sometimes some of you got caught up in a dimension. You were like, for lack of a better word, and we use secular words, you were in a moment. In that moment, you didn't feel hungry. You might even have forgotten to eat. And you're caught up in that atmosphere. And in that moment, you don't feel hunger. You might not even feel pain. You only feel that certain presence of God. And you could be entering a place of prayer or whatever it is. And then when it's over, then only you feel your body. Then you feel the hunger or the things of your body. I can say right now, every one of you, including those online, have experienced those moments. The question is how to expand those moments, which could be seconds, minutes, hours, or days, into a lifespan. So when they expand into that, you physically cross dimensions. Your body becomes trans-dimensional. Yes? Uh, Pastor, the, uh, Moses, Elijah, and even Jesus, uh, before he went to the cross, are they functioning in a slightly different uh, dimensional state than uh, those who are uh, in the New Testament. So uh, I'm asking that uh, whether in the changes after the resurrection. Yeah, after the resurrection, um, Jesus' body can take on the, the, the resurrected body, and we also can tap into the uh, transfiguration, the, the resurrected body. And is that different from the Old Testament? Uh, good, saints? good question. Because Jesus, Moses, Elijah live in the Old Testament. The question basically, repeat for those online, is, is there a difference now that we are born again? Now before we answer that, remember the Bible says that truth will vibrate inside your spirit you are born again. So before we answer that, check in your spirit is there a difference between old and new? Your spirit is telling you, yes. Your spirit is telling you, yes. And then hearing your spirit say yes, that's where the Bible is useful. What is the difference? The difference is that now is within your grasp of your faith. 
what Paul had a glimpse of when he saw the possibility of the New Testament that is within our grasp. That the resurrection life and the resurrection power through a process of breaking those barriers and meditation that you could transmute your body away from the physical which is the resurrection power that God makes available based on all the teaching and um, 2nd Corinthians 3 18 as you behold you are transformed and as Paul says in Romans 8 the spirit your body is dead but the spirit is life and gives life to your body and so there is life being given to the body so the answer is yes there is a difference but to understand the difference you need to understand what happened in the old to understand how it can happen in the new so the basic principles are still the same Jesus did say what did Jesus say when he was transfigured he said there are some who stand here who will not die but they will see the kingdom of God come in glory they will not die but see the kingdom of God come in glory which means that the, when the kingdom of God comes in glory transfiguration becomes a fact for all those who are in the kingdom of glory because up to the transfiguration in Matthew uh, 17, Mark 9, Luke 9 which took place in the Gospels it was a glimpse and Peter wrote about it and said we saw the glory we heard the voice which brings us to this end time the kingdom of glory has come in the book of Enoch it described the tree of life and it talked about how the tree of life was transplanted into the New Jerusalem and it also speaks about how those who are born of the Son of Man he saw only the Son of Man remember he came before Jesus manifest they will partake it and then there was a statement made in the book of Enoch they will live as their forefathers did you know how long they live? 1000 years nearly Methuselah, the son of Enoch lived 969 years the longest living man Adam lived 930 years because they had something of the life of God but those who had the life of God they will have the resurrection life even upon them which is why before you receive something the word must come first without the word there is no faith so the word, the teaching, the knowledge must come and God can only give it in its proper time and revelation in its proper time and revelation a doctrine becomes common like today being born again is a common doctrine being baptized in the spirit speaking in tongues is a common doctrine it has touched uh, one third of Christianity and revolutionized Christianity long ago when it was new it was being persecuted but Time Magazine calls it the third movement in Christianity when Pentecostalism swept through Christianity first as a Pentecostal revival then as a, as a charismatic move so Jesus went through 40 days now, up to that time everything was personalized it was still in A personalized but it was real to one person that one person Jesus experienced a trans-dimensional 
substantiation in his body. It was true and real. Not many people might know what he did, 40 days and 40 nights. But he has touched on something. He touched on something. Whether he touched on something for 40 days, or you touch on something for a few seconds, a few minutes, a few hours, or a few days. If you cross that barrier and touch it, it has become a reality to you. Thus, Jesus was able to say in verse 1, Man shall, live, shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So, what was he being sustained by? The word of God. The word of God was sustaining his physical body. And his physical body was living just purely based on the word. It's almost like the body that Adam had, that if he didn't eat anything, he would still not die. In fact, according to the book of Adam and Eve, which is another apocrypha, they didn't eat for a long time because eating was new to them. And they didn't die for some time because their body was still slowly being changed. Eating three meals a day was something that became common when man has been in sin for thousands of years. But when Adam and Eve first freshly fall, you think that they wake up the next day after they, they, they fell and say, we must have three meals a day. Breakfast is the most important meal. <laughs> what is breakfast? What is lunch? What is dinner? They don't even know what those concepts are. And you read the book of Adam and Eve, they didn't eat for a long time. In fact, Adam was trying to die because he was full of remorse. He didn't eat so he could die. Tried to drown himself or whatever and all those things, but could not. And it took probably when the timing of Adam and Eve's story, many months before they started eating. And at first they don't eat animals at that time. They only eat fruits. It took them some time to adapt to having a meal as a regular time. And they didn't straight away eat three meals a day or five meals a day like Singaporeans, including supper. Apples in the morning, light cheese in the afternoon, rambutans and dinner, durians for supper. No, they did not. They just ate a little bit and that's it. Then didn't eat for some time. Then ate a little bit and that's it. It took mankind thousands of years to develop the philosophy that we would need three meals a day and breakfast is the most important meal. <laughs> because we're talking about the fallen body. And it's important to adapt the body back to its perfection. The first is breaking all this, all this secondary laws that cover the fallen body were not operating in under the first time. Which is why, you know, uh, it is still a debate out there whether breakfast is the most important meal. And sometimes you got research that prove one, sometimes prove the other, then after some time the other can counter research and prove still there. Because it has nothing to do with truth, truth. It has to do with what I call studying a phenomena. When you study a phenomena, you will find facts on one side and facts on the other side, facts on the other side, but it has nothing to do with truth. It has to do with observe phenomena. Just like you observe the sunrise in the east doesn't mean that the sun is moving. An observed phenomena is a true phenomena in experience, but it's not necessarily the fact and the truth. The fact is the earth rotate that make the sun look like moving. So, observation of a phenomena does not necessarily produce facts and true reality, which is why we have the Bible. Say, so how then do we determine what is true and not true? Thank God we have a book. In the end, you might. Some of you might learn mechanics or computer, 
and you open out the computer, open out the car, and all that. You know what's most important? Because each car is slightly built differently. The manual. Each car and everything comes with a manual. What each part is, where everything is, and the manual describe what everything does. This life. This physical world came with a manual that tells you if you do these things, you will die. If you do these other things, your life will be longer. Correct? Thou shalt honor your father and mother and you will have long life. And it says, this manual tells us, even for countries and a group of people, if you sin and continue to live in sin, and continue to worship idolatry and false gods. All these sicknesses will come. It is a manual to tell us how to run countries, how to live our life, how to live in communities, how to live our personal life. So all truth must be explained by this manual. Except the manual is big manual. Because this life is complex. It tells us many, many departments and things and how one, link, one thing linked to the other. So we have here in the Bible that all observed phenomena must check back with the manual, whether it's true. Sometimes they don't check back. So that a thousand odd years ago, the church, like the world, believed that the world was flat. That the world was flat, surrounded by oceans and further out ocean, then you fall off the edge. The church also believed that. And as a result, no one checked back with a manual that says that God sits on the circle of the earth. Isaiah chapter 40. Both spear is three dimensional. A circle is. You're talking about the circle, you say. Okay, two dimensional circle. <laughs> so I'm not trying to tell you that. <laughs> Very clever trying to explain that. But because we live in three dimensions, we live in three dimensions, a circle is only two dimension. So it's a spear. Yeah, definitely interpretation is a spear uh, because you're three-dimensional. And um, but circular in that sense that there is no edge to the thing. That's a verse in Isaiah 40. And then, he then remember it's the church that persecuted people like Nicholas Copernicus and Galileo Galilei. And these people were the ones who used a telescope and look at the sun and the stars and the moon and all the satellites and planets. And they say, according to the calculation and observation, the earth is moving around the sun like other planets. And the church wanted to burn them alive because it was heresy. When did the church become an arbitrator of scientific truth? Because of traditional thinking and they did not check back with the manual. Now where does it say that? That the sun is going round the earth in a sense. Now, the manual is important. So here, Jesus said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And then there are other temptations. Then in verse 14, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. In other words, He finally conquered an enemy that was creating a barrier 
between true reality and blessings for mankind and what is false. Look at what Satan tried to tell him. Firstly, Satan tried to convince him that he will die <coughs> of hunger if he didn't eat something. Jesus says, I don't have to eat to live. I live and then I can eat if I want to. That principle was still operating in John chapter 4 when he was actually hungry and the disciples went to buy some food and while he was there he was thirsty and he spoke to the Samaritan woman give me a drink and then through a time of conversation he was evangelizing her telling her the truth and by the time the disciples came a Samaritan woman quickly ran away and the disciples brought back food remember that was why they went away and then Jesus says I have food to eat which you do not know of they, they were stunned what food actually he neither drank nor ate he actually asked for a drink the Samaritan woman got so engrossed in theology that it never gave him a drink that there was no record that she actually gave him a here sir here's a drink no they were talking, 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 and then, then she went, oh, he never got his drink. <laughs> but he said he had eaten. Disciples said, who, who bought food for him? What did he eat? He was talking in the spirit. That he lived in such a manner as is necessary, even though sometimes his body feels the hunger pangs, he still lived above it. He was not bound to his body. His body was his servant, not his master. So, then the devil tried to deceive by saying that all the kingdoms of the world belong to him. And that in a moment of time. See the word moment of time. But he was not convinced by the devil. Because he knows it doesn't belong to the devil. He knew the truth. The devil tempted him to bow down and then get everything. Shortcut. Jesus knew he was going to get everything back. And he also knew it doesn't belong to the devil. But you know why? The devil tried to convince him it belonged to him. But Jesus was going to drive the devil out. Under all authority, heaven, earth and hell belongs to him. He knew that Satan was the barrier. Basically, he overcame the devil and he returned, as in verse 14, in the power. See the word dunamis, power? Now, that is what breaks the barrier. A quantity of dunamis power helps you to break the barrier. Like for example, everything that we have runs on electricity. If there was no electricity, the TV won't work. If there was no electricity, your phone won't work. Your phone works on batteries and power. And then, if the phone battery goes below a certain level, doesn't even go to zero, even though you say, hey, my phone is dead, yeah, your phone is dead, but the battery is not 100% dead. It probably has microvolts still inside. But whatever microvolts still is not enough power to run your phone. So you need to recharge your phone. That means that the electrons that are running are below certain voltage. And when they're below certain voltage, it just cannot run anymore. Which means that you need a certain voltage and energy and power. So we have this understanding. What makes something manifest? Dunamis power. Energy of God. Which is summarized in Acts chapter 10. When it speaks about Jesus. In a sermon. 
and um, and speaks about Jesus being anointed by God. That's uh, verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, do not miss, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. See, the devil was a barrier, causing a reality of sickness and disease. But Jesus has a higher reality that could remove that. For God was with him. So back to this original point here, which comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 101 on gifts of the Spirit, we must receive a manifestation. It is obvious. Here you can see that it's based on this key in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. That uh, verse 7 the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one. Each one, for the profit of all. That means there must be a manifestation. A phanerosis that takes place before you can say that it's the Holy Spirit working. Otherwise, it's you working. But it starts from the inside. God needs an instrument. It's one moving to n squared. It starts from one before it can multiply. And as more people are trained and become more aware of a manifestation, then only can work the gifts of the Spirit. See, the gifts of the Spirit operate differently. It's like when people come out to pray, you can just say a prayer. You don't need to feel or sense a manifestation. You could do that. You could be interceding and praying. You could do anything and pray. But there is only one dimensional of, of living. There's another aspect of living where the Holy Spirit manifests. And when the Holy Spirit manifests, you want to flow with what the Spirit is trying to manifest. Because that manifestation can lead to many other things. The Holy Spirit starts a fire. The Holy Spirit uh, starts an energizing. And you want to look at what is being energized. It's just like when your phone rings. There's a lot of things happening behind the phone. Today, our phones are still mainly audio. Although, the time will come when next time your phone rings, you're looking for video. Might be a watch phone or whatever. And when video becomes more and more common, then people will think after 10, 20 years, we will say, wow, did these people really phone using just voices? Because then the new generation will be so used to phones with video. We are coming to that. And uh, where people are now, you know, using that, but it's not so common yet. And, uh, but the day will come, perhaps in the time of watch phones, when people are used to video phone and yes, and they answer and they talk straight away. But because it takes a lot of data and all that, give it another couple more years, until it's common, until someone invents some sort of thing that's so common that uh, now it's the, the, the number links straight away to video call. Now video calls are optional. You could choose it or you could choose not to have it. And uh, technology has moved and advanced to the stage where video calls are reasonably clear today. But wait till you now the internet is one gigabyte everywhere, two gigabyte everywhere, five gigabytes everywhere. Then people say, hey, why are we not using video? Because the reason why people don't use video is because in some places, internet speed is still very slow. But even in Singapore, one gigabyte is not normal. When you sign up, they don't give you half a gig. And you say, hey, why, why we need so powerful? One day you'll see, the, whatever we invent will be used. Yes? Uh, Pastor, can we just look at this verse? I, it's pressing upon me uh, for quite a few weeks, so... Okay. <laughs> uh, this uh, Luke 2.40. Luke? 2.40. Luke 2.40. 40. Luke 2 is by Mary, right? 
Magnifica. Oh, okay. And the child grew, became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. So the grace of God is actually the same, the gifts of, of God, isn't it? Yes, because the gifts is just a few extra words, charisma instead of charis. Grace is charis. Gifts are charisma. So it seems that from the time Jesus was young, his spirit was already strong. He has the wisdom of God. He has Correct. the gifts of God. But he did not manifest the gifts in the power. Correct. Although he could do it. Correct. So is that the implication? He could Correct. do it, but he didn't do it. Which is 5.2 is God's will. To do the will of God. Yes. At his right time. Correct. Because uh, when the, he, he has the power. Now here is the thing. Does Jesus have the power to turn the stones into bread? Yes. Then why didn't he do it? Because the Father never asked him to do it. He will only do what the Father asks. He will not do something out of himself. And you can cross-reference that to also John chapter 5, when Jesus said the Son will only do what the Father shows. Nothing more, nothing less. And uh, see, we need to know both. Uh, both truths are very important. Most assuredly, he says in verse 19 of John 5, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself. But what he sees the Father do, whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. He will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. Now, look at verse 20. Greater works can come, the signs and wonders can come, but only as the Father wants to do, then He will do. So who is waiting for the greater works? Jesus is waiting for the Father. Potentially, He can do it. But He understood the second principle of gifts of the Spirit 101. You don't do it unless the Father does it. Uh, so that second principle holds him back. The first principle frees him, the second holds him. Both principles must balance to work perfectly the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, so that is 100% from God. Following that principle, this is Gospel of John chapter 5. Move forward to John chapter 14 when he spoke with his disciples and he told them verse 10 do you believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me the words that I speak to you I do not speak on my own authority but the Father who dwells in me does the works because believe me that I am in the Father the Father in me, or else believe for the sake of the works. In other words, he's saying, everything he does is an expression of the Father. An expression of the will of the Father. All the signs and the wonders. So, Jesus has to do two things in us. Like right now, as I'm standing here, I have a manifestation, which I don't understand fully sometimes. Like right now, my right ear and all this is burning like fire. And I know it's not caused by the light. <laughs> I can move about and it's still there. But what is this burning fire? If we have spiritual eyes, we might see there's an angel of God and he's standing on my right side and that was having a side effect upon me. Because we're talking about some things they're interested in. So it is obvious that the will of the Father is important. Now, there are other points that we have covered. Uh, we only got time for these first two points. Uh, usually, we got other points uh, uh, where the angels are involved in the working of the gifts of the Spirit also. Those are other things. But what we need to cover is gifts of Spirit 101. Why do a lot of people not operate the gifts? Because they got no manifestation. Ile. Bo. No manifestation means you cannot operate the gifts of the Spirit. 
All you can do is just do the normal thing. Which means you need to be aware of the Holy Spirit or His angels or however He does things, which is point number three and four. But for now, you need to be aware of the manifestation. I'm always aware of what's happening in the Spirit. I'm always aware of what's happening in the Spirit. And even though things might not be happening in the natural, or happening in the natural, what is the most important awareness? What's ever happening in the Spirit? You need to be aware of what's happening in the Spirit. And only then can the gifts operate. So you ask the next question. What is a manifestation like? It can come in any... A manifestation is a physical sensation that is not caused by the spiritual realm, by the, by the physical realm, but is caused from the spiritual realm. Need to give another drawing to simplify. I like to simplify it. Uh, I'm glad that some of you enjoyed the more this simplified version. Hey, now the Sunday messages are very simple now, right? Okay. <laughs> all right, we're trying to make it as simple. And uh, we do the deep things on Friday all night or Thursday. Uh, we're not saying it's not deep, I see deep, but we're trying to simplify it. Here you are. Here you are. Let's draw. Since Christmas is coming, let's draw a snowman. Okay. Okay. Oh, I miss the snow. Right. I'd love to go back where you get snow and then can throw snowballs at somebody. Yeah. So that's, that's you, and uh, then, okay, this is a spiritual realm, this is a physical realm. We are always having things in our spiritual realm, sometimes from within, sometimes from without, right? Physically caused. A manifestation is a physical dimension caused from the spiritual realm whether upon you or upon a surrounding so that you see it like the burning bush. Remember Moses' burning bush? It was not a natural burning. It was something spiritual. Or you observe something in the corner of your eye. It could be an observation or a sensation. It could be something you feel, something you see, something you smell, something you seem to touch. Like if I sense a uh, warm sensation, uh, you got to look carefully. If I'm in Australia, the first thing to look around, is there a heater around? Right? Eliminate the physical first. Don't be like the person who close their eyes, pray and pray and pray, and then the cat jump on him, and he say, Whoa, God is here! God is here! You know? And then the, by the time he screamed, the cat jumped off, he say, Oh, Holy Spirit is here! That was not Holy Spirit, that was a cat jump on you. <laughs> so, eliminate the physical. And don't try to spiritualize everything. But after you eliminate all possible physical things, there's no more explanation. There's a direct spiritual cause. And here are, let me describe it so you can identify, right? At certain moments, and doesn't come that often now, but at certain moments in time, uh, it was lasting over about one year. That was years ago. Every time I pray, I felt this, like, nail prints on my palm. That lasted for nearly a year, you know. I didn't have to say, hey, what's this, what's this, what's this, everything, what's this, what's this, what's this. Come on. Manifestation come and go. You don't ask, you know, every morning when you wake up, <laughs> why is my breath like that? <laughs> yeah. No, you just live with the physical and, and it becomes normal to you. Or, you know, or, or you dream or you saw something and saw the, hey, what does this mean? What does that mean? What does that are you going to live a normal life in the spiritual? Or are you like, you know, like when you, when, like you, uh, from someone from, um, from, uh, you, you, you look like someone from the um, first century AD, 
living in the 20th century, 21st century, and then you look. You cannot live. You got to get used that these are all inventions. And then you go into the lift. You go downstairs, you see a bicycle, a car passing. Can you be normal? You cannot until you get used to the what is no nobody goes to a light bulb and say huh? nobody in the 21st century does that. We accept it as a as a secondary thing that is always there. You switch on the light, light comes. Correct. Don't be <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna give a Malay proverb. Uh, uh, seperti manusia hutan di dalam what city in Malay? Uh, di dalam uh, Mandai. Bandar. Bandar, yeah, bandar, bandar raya. Yes. <laughs> Something interesting. Bila was just saying, actually a baby don't care, no? Ah, oh, yes. Being a child like in the kingdom of God is very. Hey. So you see everything you saw here. Yeah. You just exalt. Correct. So, it is important to encounter the spiritual realm under its normal for you. So for nearly a year, every time I lift up my hands, I could feel really like imprints, like, like the nail prints on Jesus. And by the way, some modern theories say, oh, they cannot take the weight, so I have to go through here. You know, can tell you go to here, so I cannot take the weight lah. Have you tried hanging someone from here? Even from here, the nail? Just nails? Cannot! So how was the weight supported? Partly by the leg. If you look at the ancient crosses, you know, it's, it's the leg. Once the leg is supported, the hands is not, not the weight-bearing part. Ask any engineer. So the hand is not... Even here, they say the armor can support the weight. Not really. Engineering-wise, it will still tear and the hand will come off. So, it's here because it's not weight bearing the weight bearing was on the leg side where they done that how do you think they nail the legs to the cross two things again no there's a support wood there and they nailed it otherwise all the prisoners will slowly be drained down so there was a weight distribution and they, they, they forgot about the the leg snail. They're not they're thinking about just the hands upon the weight, uh, you know. So anyway, the stigmata, which is the scar the, the, not the scars, because there are no scars, is the the Jesus preserved that is exactly on the palms. And so if you see Jesus' hands, you will see like light coming up from the holes that is there formerly. And he preserved that for us. For about a year, I felt that. And I don't have to fully understand everything. I just knew that something was happening in the spirit. Pause. How many of you experience something like that sometime when you pray? Hey, there you your hand. Okay. That is a part of adjusting. And you are experiencing Jesus. You're becoming one with him. Now, in one with Jesus, there were only certain places in Jesus' body where he was pierced. His side, his legs, his hands, and the cross, uh, the crown of thorns. When you begin to identify and become one with him, right? You've been crucified with Christ. If the words crucified with Christ becomes real in you, would you not automatically experience some of those things? It is just like peanuts. It should be part of the pasta, the whole thing. Kacang putih. Although it's marvelous that you experience it. Enjoy the experience. You won't enjoy the experience if... 
And you could looking into the light until your eyes get blinded, then it causes another problem. <laughs> Just enjoy that sense of oneness with Him and let that finish His work. Let that finish the work. And sometimes it's so strong that every time I want to feel it, all I have to do is just lift up my hands. And I'll be enjoying that sensation. Oh, whatever it was. It's a sort of identification with Christ on the cross. Christ allows you to begin to experience that. And then when you begin to experience, like um, a hand on you, Remember, it's in the Bible. Everything you experience will be in the Bible. In the Bible, the prophet says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me. The hand of the Lord is upon me. There is a description of an experience. So when you have that, don't keep asking, Hey, 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 I experienced this, this thing. What does it mean? What does it mean? Sepulti manusia hutan di dalam bandaraya. So, don't be like a jungle man in the city. Get used to the things in the city. And the city is a city of New Jerusalem, the city of the spiritual dimension. And the spiritual dimension, there are lots of angels all the time. Correct? So don't go all excited when you saw something. <laughs> I saw, I, saw, I saw the angel. What does it mean? What does it mean? There are always angels around. God allow you. Sometimes your over excitement just cut you off. Angels say, uh, when, you, when, you, when you're going to all those sepulti manusia hutan di dalam bandaraya, <laughs> when you're going to those things, the angels say, <laughs> I try to show a little bit. They're like that. And the information passed on to all the angels. Do not show thyself. <laughs> because if that's what he does when I show myself, said the guardian angel, when you all show, the person's life might shorten. <laughs> Die heart attack. <laughs> you know? Don't. <laughs> By the way, when I study in the book of Enoch, do you know that the seven thunders and lightnings are in the book of Enoch? Enoch was the first to receive it. And we look at that on Friday. Thunders and lightnings. And, and I explained that on Friday night about the spirit beings behind all these thunderings and lightnings and the physical side effects. Now, you got to say, oh, thank you, Lord, and just enjoy. And keep looking. When Moses saw the burning bush, he didn't... Call his father, call his mother in law, call, call, call everyone. No, he in fact looked at normal and said, hmm, he's going to burn off. He thought it was a physical fire. Then after a while he said, no, it didn't burn off. Normal bush will burn finish. Neither did it spread. Let me go and check what it is. See, he just want to check what it is. He wanted to check. He assumed that it was natural, but he cannot explain it, so he wanted to go nearer. That was when the bush called out to him and knew his name. And then you interacted. So, when a phenomenon comes, when a manifestation comes, you know why many, very few Christians have their ph ph uh, phenomena? Because in point number two, their energizing is not up to there. So how do you raise your energizing level? Pray in tongues. Go to ABC. Pray in tongues. Pray in tongues for hours and hours. That is why the Charismatic and the Pentecostal, one of the things I don't understand, how a Charismatic Pentecostal person who has known the truth and the uh, outpouring of the Spirit can go back to an evangelical church where there's no freedom to speak in tongues or operate the gifts. You know why? Because in many Pentecostal churches, they don't even teach you the blessings of praying in tongues. Nor do they even have a meeting that encourage that. At least we have Friday all night. You're encouraged to just pray in tongues. So they don't see the benefits of that. But praying in tongues edifies yourself. 
The Greek word is building yourselves up. So it releases some energizing into you. And if you pray in tongues for many, many hours, I pray in tongues for uh, 48 hours and I experience open visions. I know some people have tried, they pray 24 hours, 48 hours and say, hey pastor, I tried that, I didn't have the same effect. I say, maybe, maybe each person got a different thing. Maybe for the person, it might need 36 hours. I don't know, 48, should be more. Yeah, 48, then, uh, 24, 24, 48. Yeah, maybe the person might need uh, another extra 48 times 2. We do not know. But everyone has a level where you pray and you reach a certain energizing. Now, for those of you, the practical thing, if you are able to pray in tongues and you feel sick, notice this. I know when you feel sick, you don't feel like praying. But when I was a young Baptist minister, still student pastor in Reservoir Garden Baptist Church, I was still learning the benefits of praying in tongues. And I was there in Reservoir Garden staying in the parsonage. And I felt sick, you know, people fall sick once in a while, and high fever and everything. And then, one day together with a few charismatic people, we are praying, and then the person said, hey, you know, have you tried praying in tongues? You know, you should pray more in tongues. I said, yeah, I have tongues, but I don't pray much in tongues. And though I was sick, I just uh, pray very weakly in tongues. And as I pray, pray. Within a short time, I think God was just wanting me to experience something. I felt like a warm liquid flow right through. And when it flowed right through, my fever was gone. Instantly. So I said, wow, pray in tongues has such an effect. And if you pray in tongues an hour or two a day, check. Check those times that you did it or you pray very regularly, even all night prayer, you will notice it's quite hard to fall sick. It's the opposite. Well, people fall sick almost every year. You know, it could be flu, cough, cold. There is an element where you hardly fall sick. It's a very practical application. Here's something you can test. Pray in tongues one hour, or two hours. See its impact on your body. And long ago in Malaysia, we have voluntary staff, and I have one uh, elderly lady who helps in the, those time, and those time internet books are not so popular, so physical books, you have to pack, and all those, and, and then we send, send off, we sell books all over the world, and uh, uh, we print our own books and we sell them. So she used to pack and come voluntary. So sometimes we have chat and all that, we sit down with the staff and, and then we chat over the, the, cafe, uh, uh, the staff uh, kitchen area. Then I was encouraging them to pray in tongue. And although she has sat in the church through many years of teaching, she never actually practically do that. So then she, one day she says she's going to try. So she says, I'm going to try 24 hours praying in tongue. So she said, good, let me know the effect. So she told me, that when she did that, she felt like a warm glow all over her body. Tangible. So, how to have manifestation? Pray more in tongues. Number two, meditate on the Word of God. Uh, some of you might not have experienced long meditation. Sometimes I meditated on a whole book. Or sometimes I read the whole book aloud. Like, for example, one day I decided to read the whole book of Acts out loud. So I was reading it out loud. And Acts has 28 chapters. And I can tell you, it took four hours to read through. My speed might be different from other speeds. But it took me four hours. About four to five hours, I, I, I timed myself. After reading it out loud, I didn't even personalize it. That's how much power the word has. I felt a warm sensation. Now, some of you, at the end of Friday all night, as you go back, you notice you feel a bit different. Do you? You feel a bit different. And even I feel my voice a bit different. You could feel a difference. Like something is there. 
These are all side effects of manifestation. Where the spiritual begins to impact the physical. By applying the, the actions of the spirit, it's logical. If I keep doing a physical action, I have a physical effect. If I do an action that is a spiritual action, you will have a spiritual effect. It's pure logic and mathematics. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 14 and 15, If I pray in tongues, my spirit prays. So it's obvious that when you pray a lot in tongues in the spirit, you're activating a spiritual action, even though in the natural you don't understand everything you spoke. But you're activating a spiritual action. And the quantity of the spiritual action, since quality is standard, your spirit is praying, a quantity of your spiritual action will have to produce something in the physical. Something the physical have to give way, in other words. When you're reading the word, the word, the reading itself and the word itself might be physical ink on paper. But because the word is spirit, you're, you're, you're vocalizing words that are spoken, the spoken word of God. You are actually creating spiritual action. It will have a spiritual side effect. These are the ways that you increase the dimension of the spirit acting upon the physical. And one fine day, which according to law number two, when we are personalized and trained, God will say, it is time. And He wants you to do certain things because when God looks for men and women of God, you know who He looks for? He looks for men and women who can act as uh, intermediaries between the spiritual and the physical. So you must have knowledge of the spiritual and knowledge of the physical. I know what's happening between the two. And in part of the training process, sometimes you're in your church, you're worshipping, or you're sitting under an anointed atmosphere, anointings will produce anointing. That is why it's important to sit under an anointed atmosphere, hear anointed messages, because it is the Holy Spirit flowing. When you keep exposing yourself to places or things that are where the Spirit is actually flowing, then it will have an effect on you. Rather than you expose yourself to where demons are manifest, or the flesh is manifest, in some churches, demons are manifesting and because they are apostate churches and traditional human things are and you don't feel the spirit. Sometimes you could feel the deadness of a church, a deadness of fellowship. Then I said, why are you still there? And that is why it explains why some people when they come to like let's say join us and be in this move, suddenly they begin to see more vision. Suddenly they begin to say, you know why? It's the atmosphere that is energizing that. When you leave the atmosphere, it disappears. So it's important, number three, to be under, be where the spirit is. Flow with, and then it continue to increase and energize, and the side benefit, your spirit, soul, and body become whole. Like I already said, you practice these things, you hardly get sick. And if you're struggling with any sickness and ailment, you listen to the doctors, if they told you to eat 50 pills a day, you do. And they tell you, separate it three hourly, you obey, obey obedient. Here we are telling you real things. Pray in tongues one hour a day. Cheaper than your doctor. <laughs> Your pills might amount to $1,000 a month. Plus the discipline and the clock timer to take it at the right time and the right one at the right time so they don't mix up together. Here, because something is free, 
it doesn't mean that it doesn't work. It works for Paul. It works in the Bible. It will work in your life. Praying in tongues. An hour a day. Meditating on the word. Reading the word out loud. Even you don't understand. I challenge you, if you have never experienced this, pray in tongues a long time and see whether there's a manifestation. Read the word out loud, even if not personalized, and see its impact on your life. Something happens. Do this and you get a personal side until you're so well trained and then God is able to prepare to use you to do His will. Praise the Lord. Well, that's just simple points 101, easy to catch. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we ask that you continue to open doors for each one of us to understand the dimension of the Spirit, to walk in the Spirit, because, Father, to everyone you make a way. And there's only one way, the way of the Spirit, by which we can conquer all things in the natural. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Let's all rise together. Father, we pray for manifestations of the Spirit. Because unless a manifestation comes, we cannot operate in the things of the Spirit. And many do not have manifestation because they live their life always in the five senses caused by the natural realm. But when your wind of your Spirit blows, when the energizing of the Spirit increases, we know the spiritual interacts with the natural. And we have a manifestation. So teach, one, teach each one, Father God, a manifestation. And help each one to live in the spiritual world naturally. So that they know all things are affected from the natural, upon the natural, by the spiritual. And then we can operate more and more in the spiritual. To become truly sons and daughters of God. For we are the manifest sons of God. That the world will see a manifestation on us. We are the manifest sons of God. So seal this work in each heart and life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Give you a good offering. God bless you. Amen.